active surveillance, who qualifies, who does not, how should they be monitored. Originally, this was a 15-minute talk. I asked for 20. Dave gave me 10. So I'm going to have to move fast. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, issues have come up already related to imaging and biomarkers. And while I have some stuff in here about that, I'm just going to I'm just going to uh, go th uh, over that and bypass it. My disclosures, exact imaging, and mere scientific. So this is an active field. I mean, you know, to kind of mean like this, at the, the phrase active surveillance is kind of used constantly. Uh, a lot of progress in the last few years. Uh, a lot of information about the molecular genetic, genetics of grade group 1 versus higher grade cancer. Uh, how they differ, patient selection, the impact of age, race, family history, etc. Germline testing, we've heard about imaging, new modalities, new data on both the benefits and limitations of MRI. Biomarkers, really the same story. Predictive nomograms, essentially allowing us using very conventional and widely available parameters to predict the presence of higher grade cancer. Modeling, essentially showing that even if the mortality rate in these patients starts to drift up with longer follow-up, it's still a very robust approach. We have long-term outcomes. This was one of the chief criticisms in the first decade or so. You know, you wait, people said. You, you're going to hit the 15-year time point, and these patients will start falling off a cliff of mortality. We've got lots of patients now followed 15 to 20 years. There's no cliff. Follow-up strategies, there's still not really a consensus about this, but perhaps it's emerging. The tumor microenvironment, I'll talk about that a little bit, some fascinating information just recently, and dietary modification, other innocuous interventions. And finally, we're in the era of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. There's now a, a, a boatload of these covering just about every aspect of the surveillance program. This has now been adopted by pretty much every national group that has taken an interest in it. There's a surveillance airplane U.S. military, um, and uh, we, we spoke earlier about the NCCN um, schlamozel, and uh, we're back to active surveillance as the standard of care for most patients. This is uh, just showing that about 2% of patients with grade group 1 Matt Cooperberg study have the worst uh, gen genetic aberrancy. My my inference is that these 2% probably are on the verge of histologic de-differentiation, which we know occurs, and that at really at least 90 to 95% of grade group 1 cancers have, as best as we can tell, essentially normal molecular genetics. Uh, this is a study, Bill Catalona, some of you may recall, he was the fiercest critic of active surveillance for, for a long time. He and I debated this repeatedly. To his credit, he, you know, uh, he saw the light, and he now leads a spore that is looking at uh, polygenomic factors associated with prostate cancer conversion from active surveillance to treatment. So this, to me, I can tell you 10 years ago was unimaginable. This is the first publication just came out from this really incredible effort, almost 6,000 patients on surveillance, 28 centers, three continents. We're one of the centers. And... Uh, there's going to be a, a, a flurry of publications from this extraordinary uh, initiative, but already 18 variants associated with conversion to higher grade cancer, 15 of which not previously associated with prostate cancer risk. And so, you know, even sorting out what these 15 variants mean is going to be a, an important effort. And you can see here the, the disaggregation of risk according to uh, uh, polymorphisms uh, is going to be a very powerful tool. I'm going to skip that. Uh, intermediate risk. So these are the guidelines. Most organizations say select patients carefully, but yes, it's an option, particularly for grade group two, small amount of Gleason pattern four. This is a recent systematic review that came from Moscow. Uh, how patients with grade group one versus two fare on surveillance, and there's no question there's a higher rate of metastasis, progression, prostate cancer death at 10 years in the patients who have higher grade cancer elements of Gleason 4, which Gleason 4 is real cancer. It has molecular genetic aberrancy, and it has metastatic potential, unlike 3. Uh, but the risk is not that high, and I think that's the important point. So this just came out of the VA, almost 10,000 patients on surveillance 
of whom over a thousand were intermediate risk, uh, three quarters grade group two, one quarter grade group three. So here's the prostate cancer mortality at 10 years, 3.7% in the grade group two. So 12% in grade group three, that's getting up there. Um, I don't think many people seriously think grade group three patients should be managed with surveillance. But, but clearly there's a role. You know, 96% of these patients at 10 years uh, did not suffer prostate cancer mortality, so it's how you pick them. Uh, one other, I think, supportive study just recently from UCSF, 531 grade group one patients on surveillance with biopsy progression, and about half of them remained untreated for a period of time. Either they were committed to surveillance, they weren't convinced they needed to have treatment, and the other group were treated right away, and the reassuring point was it didn't seem to make a difference whether they were treated right away or whether they waited, again, reinforcing the kind of indolent nature of most of these grade group two cases. We heard about uh, risk nomograms, this one from the Canary uh, collaboration. And you know, the, the point about this nomogram, and Matt Cooperberg alluded to this, you can take just ordinary parameters, age, BMI, PSA, volume, time since diagnosis, maximal core uh, ratio, the extent of core involvement, and get a very powerful predictor of the likelihood of higher grade cancer varying from you know 17 to 63 percent sort of thing. So that's the, the uh, risk predictor using, using conventional parameters. MRI, we've heard about it. I'm not going to go into much detail just to say uh, it's a powerful tool, but it's got its flaws. And the bottom case is the one we worry about where there's grade progression on serial biopsy, but no MRI progression. This turns out to be remarkably common. This is the chestnut paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering of 207 men on surveillance. And basically a third of the patients with a stable MRI were upgraded despite the MRI stability to grade group two or higher at three years. So you cannot rely on MRI to tell you which patients are progressing, and that's very clear. Um, and this is another study essentially showing the same thing, that uh, systematic biopsy is required in patients where the MRI is negative or positive in these men on surveillance. Uh, and this is a, a systematic review of the performance of MRI in men on surveillance, so 15 studies, sensitivity 60% for progression. You know, that is simply not good enough to rely on, specificity 75%. So as we've heard and discussed at this meeting, MRI is flawed. Uh, how can we do better? I, I really like uh, high-resolution microultrasound. It's complementary. It's not going to replace MRI. I think probably most people here have heard about this, uh, and this is uh, one study that I published a year or two ago which was the first 11 centers to adopt this technology. This reflects the learning curve, but basically we showed MRI compared to ultrasound, microultrasound for finding uh, higher grade prostate cancer, essentially no difference, a uh, little bit, bit better sensitivity of the ultrasound, specificity the same. There's now some better data coming out. This was a blinded study, which the one I showed earlier was not. So men, uh, the radiologists blinded to the MRI, and this is for each score. Um, Primus pyrads essentially the same predictive value for finding significant cancer. It really performs quite similarly. There's patients with both modality where a lesion is seen on with one, not with the other. It's about 10 to 15 percent with both. Uh, I'm going to bang through this whole biomarker section because I don't have time, except I'll make one point. Tumor heterogeneity with respect to the tissue biomarkers is the confounder. It doesn't mean they aren't useful, and it's particularly the grade group two who is considering surveillance, but this and several studies show that 95 percent roughly of the mutations in patients with multifocality have unique mutations in each cancer. They're not shared. The brown is the shared. So that's the limitation. Uh, I'm going to go through this. The sentinel assay, no time, no time. Final point. What do you tell patients who are on surveillance you have an opportunity to intervene? 
exercise. We heard about that dietary modification, stop smoking, the HIIT trial that uh, Mark Moyad alluded to. I agree, it's a, it's a pilot study, but with a prostate cancer endpoint showing improvement in PSA kinetics with high intensity interval training. This is the one point I wanted to make. This is a fascinating article just published in New England Journal about the impact of obesity on the tumor microenvironment. We've all known for a long time that obesity was not good for prostate cancer. This study explains why. And there's this, this really very fascinating biologic phenomenon that in men who are obese, the tumor cells become acquisitive of free fatty acids. And essentially, the immune cells that are in these tumors are deprived of free fatty acids paradoxically. It leads to altered fatty acid partitioning, impairing T cell infiltration function. So, in obese men, you have impaired intratumoral immunity mediated by something called PhD3. Doesn't really matter what the mechanism is. If anyone's interested, there's the reference. This is, this is from Cell, it's the same story. And uh, that is why it appears to be, obese men do worse. They have altered tumor microenvironment with respect to immunity. There's a couple of studies showing periprostatic fat is associated with a worse outcome, just confirms the, the, um, uh, uh, the concept. And so how do we do surveillance today? My last slide, uh, MRI and confirmatory biopsy within a year, we still do that, but then very few biopsies after that, perhaps every five years. MRI about every three years, the idea of annual or semi-annual or even every three-year biopsy is old. We don't, no one really uh, thinks that needs to be done anymore. Definitive intervention only for grade progression, intervene with other health measures, and emerging, which I didn't have time to talk about, but this dynamic risk profiling with accurate biomarkers that are emerging to replace most of the biopsies. Thank you for your attention.